evening, everyone. Welcome to the Central Union High School District um, School Board meeting dated February 8th, 2022. At this time, we need to, um, I would like to let people know what was done in closed session. The board voted unanimously to approve the dismissal of a permanent certificated employee. The motion was made by Trustee Jones and seconded by Trustee Hernandez. Total of four to zero vote, four A's, zero no's. For the rest of the stuff, every um, direction was given to staff. If now everybody could rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. And we do have a new uh, student board member, Eric Valenzuela. Can you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. We move on to communications and recognitions. First off, the governing board report. Trustee Jones. Thank you. Uh, hope everybody's doing okay. I just gotta catch my breath a second. <laughs> I'm older than dirt. <laughs> oh. Uh. I want to recognize a couple of people tonight. Since the last time we met, uh, we've had two retirees from the Southwest faculty pass away. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a lady by the name of uh, Verna Hall pass away. Verna started the Central in 1997, shortly after we opened the school, and she retired in 2004. Verna was a character. She had a sturdy laugh. And I had trouble keeping up with her. I'm sh I have a short life. Uh, every time I took a step, she, she would, every time I took three steps, she would take two or one. She had a, a nice white stride. She had a good sense of humor. She was an art teacher. She was fun to be around. Then yesterday I got word that one of our teachers who retired, Janet Gruse. She was a business teacher at Southwest. She was hired in 96, and she retired in 2015. She and her husband had gone to Florida to spend their retirement years. They were close to her mother, and this was sort of an unexpected, uh, untimely demise for her. But she was in the business department, the department chair, and she, did a lot for our school, for Southwest, and uh, as a department chair, she really helped build up the business program. So I would like us to take a second, or a few minutes, just have a, mo a moment of silence for these people. You feel you want to make me, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Uh, Trustee Peinado. Hi, good evening, everybody, fellow board members and um, our community. Um, just to recap, February is Black History Month and we're celebrating as a district. Um, I attended the district's Black History Month kickoff event on Saturday, January 9th, where we had a presentation by author and Stanford Law Professor William Gould IV. The event was very well attended by fellow board members, teachers, students, city council members, and ju judicial representatives. Um, it was a really true honor to host Professor Gold on our school campus, and being the first African-American law professor hired at Stanford University, his contributions to academia have been consequential. 
Um, it was his first time visiting our campus and I wanna make sure it's not the last. I especially appreciate partnering with Mrs. Gretchen Lowey and Marlene Thomas of the Imperial Valley Social Justice Committee for their efforts to bring Professor Gould to Southwest High School. And I look forward to continued partnership with that organization in the future. Um, also, um, I want to congratulate Southwest High School on being the 2022 Academic Decathlon Champions for Imperial County. This year's theme was water, a most essential resource. And I think it was a very appropriate theme for our county. I appreciate all the students that participated in Academic Decathlon for their academic commitment. And I hope that more high schools become involved in Academic Decathlon. Uh, I just want to wish good luck to all the Eagles um, at the state championship. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Rodriguez. <clears throat> good evening, board members, student board members, Dr. Anderson, those in attendance. I want to let everyone know that the board appreciates you taking the time out of your day to attend this meeting, whether you're streaming or whether you're here in person. Um, I would like to begin by recognizing the El Centro FFA. Um, I want to encourage the parents and the students to follow them on social media. It's El Centro FFA. We'll be entertained. Very, very entertaining page. Very active. Uh, next, it's uh, National School Counselors Week. And I want to express my gratitude to all of our school counselors. Um, I'm a big advocate for social emotional wellness, mental health, and um, our counselors, they pay a, a big role in our children's education. And um, next uh, February is also CTE month um, at our district. Uh, from a personal experience, the Law Academy, um, the pathway provided my daughter Estrella um, I gave her the tools, the confidence to join the Army. So to this day, she's been in the Army for about six months. She's won several awards, um, advancements, and um, in, in such a short time. And, and um, her foundation was the Law Academy that, that provided at Central. And it's a very, very good um, program. Um, lastly, our COVID clinics. Um, they are available during school hours. It's a free service available to our parents and our students and staff. And thank you, that concludes my report. Thank you. Trustee Hernandez. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I just wanted to go over, uh, again, congratulations to Southwest Academic Decathlon, pretty much everything that has been covered. So I guess the main part that I would wanna cover is, because um, I've been having th this issue myself, is uh, during this time, I've just been uh, sometimes uh, forgetting about the positives in a lot of things and, and I'll, I'll focus on the negative um, because I think a lot of us are our hardest critics on ourselves especially with admin um, even students down to students even sometimes in terms of we just want so much right we want we want the straight A's or we want this even if it's not A's it's in sports I want to be the best in this and even with myself I, I have found myself that sometimes I'm focusing on that one thing that I don't have or I haven't accomplished, and then I forget about all the things that I have accomplished. And so sometimes from the district down, I would like uh, even students and everybody just to remember like, even though there are times that you may focus on the negative, to take some time out of your day to focus on the positive things that you have accomplished throughout the year. And it is great to have goals, but also at the same time, focus on the positive things that you have achieved throughout that time because I've been, I think Dr. Andrews advised me in that as well and I appreciate that. But also I wanted to share that with you guys that it is normal to have days where you forget about, you know, all the good things that have happened to you throughout the year, all the things you've accomplished, even principals, admin, and we do appreciate that even though sometimes it's not, it's not seen or said, but I would like you guys or anybody, students, parents even too, um, that sometimes we focus so much of what's going wrong that we forget about to focus on the positive. So I hope that we continue to do that, or if you have forgotten about that, I hope um, this coming weekend or in this three-day weekend that's coming up, you take some time to just focus on the great things that you have done for the district and for the students and students what you have done for yourselves or little brothers, sisters, or anybody. Um, so I really appreciate it and thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to reiterate everybody, like we, we all, academic decathlon, everybody, we, I come at the end so I <laughs> don't have anything new, except um, we did take Dr. Gould to dinner that, that Saturday night and it was just inspiring and, and just 
to be able to pick his brain, you know, and, and Dr. Gold was, is a, a, a um, lover of baseball. <laughs> And so I got to pick his brain on that, you know, and it was just amazing. He has worked with Major League Baseball to, instruct, to end the lockouts and, and everything. And he told me, and I quote, that the Houston Astros deserve that asterisk. <laughs> okay? I just want to. <laughs> so, because I picked his brain on that, and he says, yes, they deserve it. So, for the record. Okay, we move on. Superintendent's report. Um, thank you, President Garcia Ruiz. Um, just to, to kind of bring us up to speed, um, again, I appreciate the work that's been done by this district. It is a tremendous place to work, and I'm very grateful to be a part of it. Um, just as a, as a side note, we all know this. January was a very difficult month in our schools. The Omicron variant had a tremendous impact on our students and our staff and our families. Um, it still is to a certain extent, but we are starting to feel the, the, the backside of it. Uh, we did pull through the challenge with tremendous work by our staff to cover classes. There was a massive surge in testing when we were doing about 300 tests a week to almost 2,500 tests a week at our COVID clinics. Even though the clinics were doing the testing, our staff were also managing all the students in and out of all of that and families that came to the school for that service and employees and family members of employees who came to the schools for that service. So it was a tremendous benefit that we had. A special thanks go to our district health coordinator she spent many, many hours well into the evenings and on weekends. And even when there were cases within her own home, she put them out in a trailer out in the front yard so she could keep working on the Saturday and Sunday. Tremendous effort by this staff to do everything they could uh, to try and inform families and really kind of point people back to use the county's decision tree. Our attendance though is on the, on the rise, it's improving. Um, last week we averaged around 91, 92% attendance rate, which is pretty good. And this afternoon I checked today's attendance rate and we were just about 97%, which is above normal. So we are seeing somewhat, it feels like a return getting past the, the, COVID, the uh, Omicron surge. It may not be over. We don't know what's gonna hold next, but it, we're seeing that as a positive move. I really appreciate our student organizations. The, the folks who are sitting here in front of you in terms of student board member reps uh, they represent their schools. I had a chance to meet with them this week. All, all three of them hear their wonderful stories. Um, and, and this is really different than in all the years past when I've worked with ASBs as a principal or a district administrator. In years past, we heard a lot about school spirit. We had rallies, we had rally commissioners and skits and fun stuff. But what we're seeing from our student body organizations is this real deep care about each other and supporting each other in their well-being. It's unlike any other time I've ever seen in schools. And so the young people in front of you who will report on their activities coming up, you'll hear this tone, so listen for it, about caring for other students. So it isn't school spirit and wearing blue or wearing purple or green or whatever it is the color may be, although there's a little bit of that. It's really about how do I help, how do we help each other connected to school and services and support. It's really delightful to hear. Again, congratulations too to the Southwest uh, Academic Decathlon team. But mock trial is also underway. That started. It's virtual right now, but it's underway, and our teams are competing. Our winter athletics are coming to a conclusion. Our student athletes have been competing, and we're having less cancellations now for all the reasons. Uh, but also, winter spring sports are starting up here in the coming weeks as well. So we have a little bit of a crossover. That's pretty exciting to see. Um, if you haven't seen the news or heard the news, the state has announced that the, they will let the statewide mask mandate expire on February 15. Our county may continue the mask mandate longer, but the state one is going to expire on uh, next week on February 15. That does not apply to schools. Masks are still required in classrooms at this point in time for the foreseeable future. Um, we haven't heard much about that. Um, in Sacramento, State Senator Richard Pan has proposed legislation placing COVID-19 vaccine on the required vaccine list for school attendance, and also removing the personal exemption belief for COVID vaccines. We don't know how that'll play out in the final law, but there's a law that's proposed out there that will affect our schools. There is a chance that will become law and it would take effect sometime in 2023. So it won't be the rest of this school year, probably not even the start of this school, next school year, but in the future, it's likely to have some sort of effect on our schools. So I want, I want the community to also be aware that that is happening in Sacramento. We are very excited about Parent University second semester. It is all about social, emotional well-being for our students. And we have around 150 or so parents that have registered. 
many, many of them are continuing on. What's really delightful is that some of the families who would come to our lab and get help are not there anymore because they took the class on digital literacy and they bought a laptop and they can log on from home now. So um, it's had an impact. We look forward to celebrating them end of the month on February 28th. Our state of our schools presentation, which is normally in February, is being postponed to March because we'll have it in the STEM lobby of the STEM building, which leads me to my next uh, announcement, which I don't have an announcement yet. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, there's still progress being made. Um, there are some final details that are just, we want it right, we don't wanna rush it. And so um, we're in the final weeks of those finishing details. We anticipate a, a, an announcement about a ribbon cutting coming sometime maybe a week from now or so when we'll publish a date. And so we're looking forward to that. There'll be staff tours, public tours, there's training for teachers and a variety of things before we can even move in. We're also working on a second aquatic center planning meeting for the community to look at designs. And like the last time, there'll be displays up there and you can add sticky notes of what you like and don't like about the different designs. Our architect will take all that into consideration and then do a presentation for the board, for the board specifically to give input. We hope that by the end of the spring semester, we'll have a final plan to present to the board. Once that's approved, we'll go into the final engineering design phase before we submit to DSA. So we are making progress there. Um, and then lastly, just to report, last Tuesday in this room, we had a special board meeting. We had a presentation by the PTI group that did an, an assessment on our facilities and our, and our work that we do in transportation. Um, from that um, has spawned many conversations based on their recommendations and the district is hard at work at beginning to implement those and a report will be made to the board soon about what that work is being accomplished including the position of a uh, operations prevention and safety supervisor to help support that effort. So I just want to provide that effort or that report. Thank you Madam President. Um, good evening, board members, Superintendent Andrews, and community members. My name is Magali K. Navarrete, and I'm your board representative for Central Union High School. During the month of January, our ASB focused on preparing for second semester events. Our ASB held its yearly leadership convention where we informed those interested in becoming an ASB officer, ASB commissioner, or class officer. Our ASB also helped distribute perfect attendance and honor roll certificates in the last week. Recently, we've also been preparing for our ASB second semester projects, which will last until May. Last Friday, we held our winter sports assembly, recognizing our winter sports athletes and announcing our winter homecoming nominees. In accordance to our upcoming homecoming dance, we'll be holding a spirit week from Tuesday, February 8th to Friday, February 11th. We'd also like to recognize our outstanding CTE students from public services, Adriana Herdar Zem Zembrano, Elijah Perez, Daniela Hernandez del Toro, Corrine Zavala, and Edrell Jimenez, and our outstanding students from CTE Health Sciences and Medical Technology, Nicholas Buford, Cassandra Gangora, Leilani Pradis, and Giselle Castillo. We'd also like to acknowledge the several students who will be participating in the virtual Greater San Diego Science and Engineering Fair. We'd also like to congratulate our mock trial team for their win last Wednesday against Southwest. Along with the end of our winter season, we, our winter wish campaign has wrapped up for the year. And lastly, we'd like to express our excitement for the new nutritional vending machines that started service today. As our ASB had collaborated with our nutritional food team to create a video for our students to learn how to use them. As the season comes to an end, our commissioners of athletics have worked hard to recognize and support our winter sports teams all throughout the season. We'd like to congratulate our CUHS girls wrestling on their seventh place place finish in CIF division, and we have four girls competing at the CIF Masters for the opportunity to compete at the state championship. Another highlight would be both our varsity basketball girls and boys teams currently competing for league and our varsity girls and boys soccer teams which are also competing for league. Last Saturday we held our spring sports tryouts and we hope to have a great season. Our future sports events include February 10th varsity boys basketball versus Southwest at 7 p.m and we'll also hold our winter homecoming coronation at halftime. Um, on February 10th, we also have our varsity girls soccer versus Imperial at 6 p.m. Our future ASB events include February 12th, which is our winter homecoming dance at 
Um, on February 24th, we have our ASB officer elections, and in March, we have our ASB commissioner applications and interviews. I thank you all for your time tonight and remind you to follow our, so our social medias at COHS Updates on Instagram and COHS Spartans on TikTok. Thank you. Thank you, Magali. Uh, now we have Southwest High School student board member, Mariana Sofia Lara. Okay, good afternoon, board members, superintendent, and people in the audience. My name is Sofia Lara, and I'm the Southwest High School um, School Board Representative. So starting off, our ASB, our PR committee, it, that's responsible for social media, has been really successful in promoting our school events, such as updates in Eagle Country. ASB attended on January 21st, Boy Spark City basketball game versus Hopeville, our homecoming game. Uh, and we would like to congratulate our homecoming royalty, Herman Molina and Allison Aispudo seniors. Southwest Studios presented a winter homecoming spirit week that took place from January 18th throughout January 21st. Um, our academics and athletics organized a way to honor our first semester dean list kids that have worked really hard and have gave, and gave out a little snack and drink to them, being lower classmen Wednesday 19 and upper classmen on Thursday the 20th. ASB Academics and Athletics has been celebrating teachers' birthdays uh, from the month of January and February and recognize our athletic, our athletic student of the month. ASB Leadership and Link Crew um, distributed swag bags to the entire campus all month of January. We, uh, we have our student project party taking place during February 14th throughout the 18th being called We Not, we Not Meet Week. It consists of uh, loves and each letter represents a day. On Monday is called Love Letters Monday and it's about unity on campus. And then we have Open Your Heart Tuesday is about empathy, sharing one another's feelings, thoughts, all about things and people in Southwest. Very loving Wednesday, collaborating of faculty and student body to create a drone image and in support of potential work with the American Heart Association. And then we have Everyone Matters Thursday, including all SHS students work with our SET and ICOE departments. And then we have Sing Together Friday and then supporting appreciation one another talent and it's expressing of creativity and skills together and we'll be doing karaoke outside in the amphitheater. Our, uh, our sports, athletics, our varsity cheerleading team has been qualified for CIF State. Boys varsity basketball has their city champs taking place on Thursday this week, February the 10th against Central in Spartans House. And our sports background is going to be taken in the NPR this week. Our host of program is continuing with their Mindful Mindness and Wellness Wednesday, preparing for their state leadership conference competition with students, have continued to create significant positive impact on campus, providing impactful mental health awards and so to students. They are selling uh, Valentine Grants that will begin selling barbecue tickets in the near future and has meeting plan with virtual anatomy program for students collaborating with GCU. Our theater program has planned a show on March 10th, but we're looking forward to, to knowing more information about it. AVID has planned on doing, has been doing uh, lunch activities to increase exposure of the AVID program and also recruiting new students to the program. Advisory presentation to freshmen about the AVID program. Linker has continued with more activities planning, has been going on Friday, freshman advisory classes, and as well as lunchtime activities slash games. Our academic decathlon program is preparing for a competition with, with a accord in February, and I would like to congratulate them because they won first place in country super quiz and scored highest in A, or honors category. Uh, there's a signing short and planning concluding party for the end of the semester and beginning to prepare for competition around late March. Our key club it has been doing recycling events all around campus. They've been planning on utilizing some of, some of their budget to provide Valentine's supply bags to the homeless population of the school and checking with other student sites to see any other volunteering opportunities. I'd like to thank you all and please make sure to follow on our social media at Southwest ASB on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you so much for your time and support. Thank you. Thank you. Now we move on to the Desert Ocean High School student board member, Eric Bonacera.
Good afternoon. My name is Eric Valenzuela, the new Desert Oasis ASB president. In ASB, we recruited new members and we have started to plan newspaper weeks for the month of February. The coming week, February 14th through the 18th, we have put together a Valentine Spirit Week. Uh, on Monday, we have Valentine colors, red, pink, and white, what we will wear. On Tuesday, we will do couples, dress as a couple or twin as friends. On Wednesday, date night, we will dress formal. On Thursday, we'll wear red if we're taken, wear green if single, wear yellow if it's complicated, <laughs> wear, <laughs> wear white if you're not interested. <laughs> On Friday, we have Super Bowl Friday. We will wear jeans with any football jersey or shirt. And the activities for our Valentine's Spirit Week will be a treasure hunt. We will have people find 14 missing hearts, one heart allowed to each person. And the 14 people who have found the missing hearts participate in a cakewalk, like the carnival cakewalks, in order to win prizes big and small. In our after school program arc, the month of January, we introduce clubs like dancing, guitar lessons, cooking, and gaming. The clubs that have been set for February are basketball, which they will play against Brawley on the 15th of February. Ballet, fashion, dual language, which is French, jewelry, self-defense, photography, and homework help. Follow us on our new TikTok, Desert Oasis High, and our Instagram, D-O-H-S-A-S-B. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, so uh, we award our Students of the Month by grade, and our ninth grade Student of the Month is Guillermo Duran. Come on up, Guillermo. <laughs> Guillermo's uh, interests and hobbies include, he's begun uh, the Upward Bound program. He enjoys puzzles and hanging out with his friends and family. In the future, this is a good one, he plans on going to SDSU to start his career as a teacher. So Guillermo, congratulations. Keep up the great work. Our 10th grade student is Maritza Fernandez. Is Maritza here? In case uh, Maritza's family is able to join us um, online, uh, she is a current member of the girls' tennis team, and when she graduates, graduates, she plans to finish high school and study in a university in Northern California to become either a lawyer or a, an architect. So Maritza, if you're watching, congratulations. Keep up the great work. <laughs> Our junior is Luis Wong Moreno. Tampoco? Oh, man. Okay. All right, Luis. Congratulations. He has been active in basketball, tennis, and MESA. He was a member of the IVC, excuse me, the IVL Tennis Champs. He is in the IB Diploma Program, and he's going to be playing tennis and hopefully be able to compete at CIF again this year. He studied, he plans to study out of state and his career pathway in computer science, security software developer, or technology engineer. So big time congrats. Uh, to Luis Wong Moreno. He is our junior student of the month. And our senior, our senior is Ana Bustamante Guevara. Anna's not here either? Oh man. Thank you. All right, Anna, also very active, varsity swimming and key club. Her hobbies are photography and art. She's participating in the culinary program and journalism the yearbook club, and she participates in community service with Familia de la Valle, del Valle. She also plans to attend a four-year college in California with a major of fashion, merchandising, or management. So I hope our students of the month were able to join us virtually, and congratulations to our Eagles.
Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Thank and we move on with uh, Mr. Ocampo for Desert Oasis High School. Good evening, board. Um, I don't think Lucy is here. No, but I, she might be, you know, watching from home. Our, <clears throat> our student of the month, she's a student at Phoenix Rising. Her name is Linda Orozco. Linda right now is passing all her classes with you know, straight A's. Uh, she has perfect attendance. Um, her future plans is to, to go back to Central uh, to play sports. She wants to play softball or any other sport. Uh, she wants to take a business class at Central. Um, and she was telling me that her friends were telling her that there's a business class. Uh, once she goes off to college, she wants to major in business management and open her own sushi business because her dad uh, has three you know, sushi businesses in Mexicali. She wants to bring the franchise to this side uh, and start her own, you know, a sushi business. Um, and I, I'm not trying to do a commercial, but you know, I asked her, "What's the name of the, you know, your dad's business?" It says Tsunami Sushi to Go, and I guess they had one in Ensenada too. But so she wants to become a, um, I guess, an entrepreneur in sushi. So I mean, she's a, a a young lady that is very dedicated to, her, you know, school, and she's passing all her classes with straight A's. So. Linda, I know we talked, but if you're watching from home, we'll give this, you know, to tomorrow. Plus, she's also getting uh, two Cinemark, you know, uh, tickets, you know, so she can, you know, take, you know, friend with her to to the movies. So congratulations. And Mr. Lyon for Central. Okay, good evening. Uh, I do know we have a couple here. Um, and our first one, uh, at Central what we do is we do it by department. And so our special education department, our first one is Alfredo Vasquez. <laughs> Alfredo's here. <laughs> and so uh, Alfredo, this is what his, uh, his teacher said. Alfredo is a exceptional young adult he is very responsible and consistently uh, puts forth his best effort to succeed academically. Alfredo is diligent, genuine, kind, and inquisitive. His strong sense of responsibility and character make him a great peer role model. It is a pleasure to recognize Alfredo as the student of the month. So congratulations. <laughs> Our next uh, student, also a special agent, is Dominic, uh, Dominic Hurtado. There's Dominic. There's Dominic. So Dominic, his teacher says, Dominic is, a, uh, is an extremely hard worker. He gets along well with his peers and teachers. He asks good questions during class and isn't afraid to ask for help. He is always willing to help his peers out with their classwork when needed. He is a friendly, respectable, and very, and very calm. He is very kind and likes to smile. He also likes to share his accomplishments in other classes like music, he sings, and he plays guitar. This is one of the many talents that he has. It is a pleasure to recommend this fine young man for Student of the Month, and this is Mr. DeCourse. Congratulations. <laughs> See, our next uh, student of the month is from our English department, and this is Gabriel Ramirez. This is Gabriel. Yeah. So, uh, and this is Gabriel Hector, right? Yes. Too. So, this is what uh, his uh, teacher says Hector is a one of a kind student. He strives for excellence in everything he does, he goes out of his way to help uh, whoever he can and make sure that everyone is respected and valued. He uh, changes his, uh, the mood of the room instantly with his positive attitude and willingness to do whatever it takes to make the day great. It is a pleasure to be his teacher and to watch him grow as an individual. So congratulations, Hector. <laughs> so our, our last uh, student of the month is not here, but he's also with the English department. And this is Jared Martin. Jared is, is one of our varsity basketball players, and tonight we are uh, facing off against uh, Brawley, so he is uh, getting ready for tip-off. But his, um, 
The teacher said, Jared is a respectful and kind student. He is uh, continuously maintaining an ac or continuously maintains academic excellence throughout the school year. He also works well with all of his classmates. And his hope is obviously, he's a big kid, uh, is the future is to get a scholarship and play uh, college basketball or football. He was also part of our uh, varsity football team this year. And he is a freshman, so he's on the varsity team as a freshman for football and for basketball. So he's a, a great uh, a student for Central and we'll make sure he gets this tomorrow. So thank you again. Thank you and once again, congratulations to all the students. Uh, we move on to public comment session. At this point, uh, the parents, if, the students, if you guys need to, I know you guys might have um, homework. Okay, so if you, you more than welcome to stay, but if you need to go, students, okay, thank you. Good job, students. Yeah. <laughs> Not everybody leave at once. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Mid session. At this time, the Board of Trustees will hear comments, presentations, or requests on matters listed on this agenda or other topics that are not on the agenda but are within the Board's jurisdiction. Speakers are requested to give their names and addresses. Time limit for speakers is three minutes. The board shall limit the total time for public input on each item to 20 minutes. The board reserves the right to limit presentations. This meeting is being recorded. Do we have anybody that has pre? Pre President uh, Garcia Hernandez, I did not receive any requests for any? public comment. Anyone from the public at this point? No? Okay, thank you very much. We move on, approval of agenda. Uh, before we move on to this, I do have to make one correction on the agenda for tonight's board meeting under the personnel report item number four, classified employment position, instructional testing bilingual, clerk bilingual, Maria Hernandez is identified as a classification 20. However, this position su should be a classification 16. Okay. So with that, with that correction, I need an approval of the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with the said corrections. I second. We have a oh, uh, motion from Jones and Peinado. Do we do a roll call or no? No? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. aye. All against? And the students left. <laughs> Consent agenda items. All items appearing on the consent agenda are routine business matters and will be acted upon with one motion without discussion. Should any board member request that an item be considered separately, that item will be added to the end of the regular agenda. I'll move to approve the consent agenda. Items as listed. Uh, I have a motion by Ms. Jones. Do I have a second? I'll second. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez. Motion by Ms. Jones, second by Mr. Rodriguez. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. All in, against? Zero. Okay. Move on. Twenty twenty two CSBA delegate assembly election. Do you have a motion? I'll make a motion. We uh, keep Diana. Garcia reads in that position. <laughs> Thank you. I second. Motion by Ms. Jones, second by Ms. Peinado. All in favor? Aye. 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 I vote for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Any no's? No. Do you want me to read the strategic goals? What? It's up to you. Do you want to read the strategic goals? Um, for those watching and for the board member as, mm -hmm. as discussed, this is a new format. Mm -hmm. What we decided to do is that the board has had strategic goals for many years. We decided to organize our agenda items by those strategic goals to draw attention to the work that we do. And so it isn't necessary for the purpose of running the meeting, but it is nice to notice for those that are either looking online or looking at the agenda, 
that we have organized our items to fall under the strategic goals. Do you guys want me to read them? Yes or no? They might prolong the meeting. <laughs> they would make it a little longer because they are yes. lengthy okay. sometimes. Well, they're there for people. A one-time supplement for annual update for the 2021-2022 LCAP. This is an informational item only. So. Correct. So, Madam President and board members, this um, this is new this year because of the pandemic and additional dollars sent to us by the state mid-year and during the, it's kind of been a little bit of flood of money that comes at us sometimes to support students. They also required an additional update on, update on the work that we've done on the LCAP. So at this point in time, this is a one-time that we would do a mid-year update. Um, and Ms. Fox will present that to us with the information. It's found in the packet. Um, we don't know if this will become an ongoing thing to do every year. Normally, it's an annual activity as opposed to biannual. But at this point in time, it's just a mid-year update. And Ms. Fox will take it uh, from here in the presentation. Yes. Um, so this is our one-time supplement. So in this supplement, there is uh, lots of data. There's the narrative pieces. There's some budget updates. This is required of us by the state because we received so many one-time dollars this year. The state wanted to make sure that boards and communities and community uh, community partners, engagement partners, were aware of how we spend our money, where we are with our LCAP, and where we are with our mid-year data. So I do want to let you know this is kind of lengthy, but these are all the requirements that go into it. Some of the slides I'm going to just kind of go over because you have them in front of you, and others I'm going to go into with a little bit more depth. So just a little background that we had historic funding for education. You've heard um, Mr. Preciado mention it over and over again. The amount of money we received in one-time funding is unprecedented. There's an expectation of additional accountability from the state legislature. So they said, okay, here's one-time funding to help you get through the COVID crisis. However, we're adding on extra layers of accountability so that stakeholders, I'm sorry, in community engagement partners um, can see that we're spending the money if, um, effectively and for the needs of our students. Then came Assembly Bill 130, Section 124E, which was the requirement for this one-time supplement to the LCAP. Um, but here's the, the law is that by February 28th, we must present to the board the one-time supplement to the LCAP at a regularly scheduled board meeting, and it contains these four pieces. There's the actual supplement, which is the narrative piece that it had a CDE template. There's an update to the budget overview for parents. There's mid-year outcome data related to all of our metrics in our LCAP. And then the mid-year expenditure and implementation data on all actions identified in the 21-22 LCAP. So you will see that I had to delineate every action, where we were with it, how much money we budgeted, how much money we've spent so far, as well as um, all of the metrics in our LCAP required any available mid-year data. So I'm going to start with the annual update piece. This piece, this narrative piece, is the only piece of this report that will go into our 22-23 LCAP. So the narrative section is required to be included when I bring the LCAP to you in June for approval. You will also approve this piece, which is why there is no approval tonight. It is strictly informational. So prompt one was a description of how and when we engaged our community partners in regards to all of the one-time funds we received and, and any of those that were not included in our 21-22 LCAP. We did not include any of our one-time funds in our LCAP, therefore I have to report community engagement on every single um, one-time fund we received. And it's pretty repetitive. So it says here that we did not include these funds in our LCAP. And so for example, the ELO, we were allocated uh, about 3.5 million. That fund ends in 2024. We did surveys via email, we did surveys via Facebook, via the district website. We had our community partners were able to provide input on academic progress, student engagement, parent involvement. We did think tanks with staff. The district leadership team met to look at what was being um, offered as um, feedback. We took the plan to our school site councils, to our English learner advisory councils, to our parent advisory meetings, and we also used thought exchange. And we collected all this data to form our ELO plan, which you approved back in May. Educator effectiveness is the one we were allocated about 827,000. That ends in the 25-26 school year. We did surveys via email, again, Facebook, our website, and we looked for patterns and the need for professional development in that data. A through G improvement grant is the one that's coming for you tonight as a presentation, and then approval again in uh, March. We're estimated at, our estimated allocation is uh, 1060000 however, I just received our allocation today, 
we're going to hover more around 1.1 million, a little bit more than what we estimated. That also ends in 2526. We did, um, we compiled a team of counselors, administrators, we analyzed the data. We also did a survey with our students, our parents, and our staff. You have the LCAP supplemental and concentration augmentation, which we received an additional $1.3 million. That needs to be expended in June of 2022. And we used our LCAP data that we had compiled in order to um, explain the use of those funds. ESSER 3, we were allocated about 10 million, 10.8 million in ESSER 3. Those funds need to be expended by 2024. So we did um, engagement from August 23rd through the 22nd of 2021. We used thought exchange with our bargaining unit members, our unrepresented staff, our community members and our students to gather feedback specific to ESSER 3. And we asked the question, what are, they, uh, what are they most important academic, social, emotional, mental health supports that we needed to provide to our students, students with disabilities, English language learners, and others. We did presentations at the English Learner Advisory Committees, all of our, our district committees. October 15th, I sent out emails to civil rights and advocacy groups. Uh, I didn't get any feedback except from one. I received that feedback just recently. And we consulted with our district foster and homeless youth liaison. Prompt two was how we used um, the concentration grant add-on funding to increase the number of staff because we received that additional 1.3 million with the specific purpose of increasing staff who provide direct services to students, to our unduplicated students specifically, our low income, our English learners, and our foster youth. Any of our schools that were above 55%, which they all are. So we received 1,337,356 in an, in a, what they call an SNC augmentation, supplemental in um, concentration dollars. All of our schools are over 55% on duplicated count. So we're required to report our student staff ratios. So at Central Union High School, a total student staff ratio is 11 to one. That includes all classified personnel, all certificated personnel, all management. The student to staff ratio for certificated is 16 to one. That includes your, your resource teacher, that includes all your counselors, that includes your management. That's how you report that data. At Southwest, it's 11 to one for total staff and 17 to one at Southwest. At Desert Oasis, and Desert Oasis and Phoenix Rising, it's five to one and eight to one. And at the Virtual Academy, we're seven to one for total staff and 30 to one for certificated at the time of this, uh, when I wrote this. So how did we spend our money? We did, uh, we're looking for a district-wide instructional coach for college and career. Two certificated teachers um, that were funding at the Virtual Academy. Attendance intervention specialist at all at um, all three all four sites, but Desert Oasis and Phoenix Rising will share. Our family resource center coordinator, our campus security at Southwest and Central, additional, and one FTE community liaison. Um, some of those positions have yet to be filled. Prompt three is how do we engage our educational partners with the federal funds? So prompt one was about our state funds. Prompt three is about our federal funds that were not included in the LCAP. Uh, we, had to, we had to identify which federal funds we received. So ESSER 1, ESSER 2, ESSER 3. Our expanded learning opportunities grant started out as a state grant and then the state decided to do us a favor and split it into four different grants. So it's now part state and part federal. Our homeless, and children, our homeless children and youth and our learning loss mitigation funds. Um, so ESSER 1, again, you're going to see the repetition of surveys, community engagement, uh, presenting to our, our advisory committees. ESSER 3 was a little bit more in depth because there was a more of a piece of education to it, more of a learning piece to it, and a board presentation as well with that ESSER 3. Expanded learning opportunities, the same. Homeless and children youth, we, um, we did a survey with staff, we brought it to the board in learning loss mitigation. We did um, community engagement through surveys and town hall meetings. So prompt four is a description of how the LEA is implementing those federal dollars and are we experiencing success and what are our challenges? So we're gonna start with ESSER 3. We were funded at about $10.7 million in ESSER 3. And as of February 2022, we've had the following successes. We were able to provide PPE and N95 masks. 
We have weekly COVID testing occurring for those staff that are required to test, plus those community members, students, staff, and families who need to test because they're exhibiting symptoms or because they, are, uh, they have been exposed. We provided additional security to sites, both Central and Southwest, each got an additional FTE of security. We've had intercession in Saturday schools for academics, not so much intercession, but Saturday schools. We were able to contract with Imperial County Office of Education for three um, school-based mental health support specialists, licensed specialists. And we provided an alternative to in-person instruction because we were able to expand from two to four teachers at CUVA using ESSER 3. So what were our challenges? Well, we've had some challenges providing that outdoor instructional space. Um, time has not been on our side. We've taken a longer period of time to complete the STEM building. There's been a supply chain um, shortages and other things have really caused delays in completing that project. Provide support from a prevention and safety coordinator. Again, this requires a new job description. This requires um, hiring staff and there have been staffing shortages across the state of California. The same with 2.6. Uh, we have an SR3 that we are going to hire a library clerk and we have yet to be able to do that. Rigorous, curric rigorous curricular offerings. We have um, not yet offered those zero and ninth periods for those students that need to make up classes that don't fit in their schedule during the day. Um, staff shortages and the need for independent study have really pulled from the available pool for that. And then transportation is struggling in low income students. We haven't been able to implement that because there has been a shortage of vehicles in the Valley that we can purchase. And we're almost, almost to that one. And I believe that last one's gonna move over to LCAP here pretty soon, because we have some funds available there. So prompt five is using its fiscal resources received for the 21-22 school year and how those resources align with our LCAP. So we have really worked hard, uh, Mr. Preciado and I, to align all of our plans together. And I've created a crosswalk um, that kind of aligns all of the plans mentioned in this um, this shows if it's tutoring, we have it in these plans. If it's um, transportation for low income students, it's in these plans. So in, in this piece, the safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of service plans has a link to the LCAP because we're funding after school programs as a way to continue services and other things. Um, the light speed technology is a way that we're continuing to offer interruption fee service, free services. ESSER 3 has direct links to our LCAP, specifically LCAP goal five. Actions 1.9, repairing and improving school, uh, school facilities. And 1.11, provide support from a prevention and safety coordinator, expand the services that we're offering in LCAP to that next level. All right, so those, this is the piece, the narrative piece that's going to be required to be in our LCAP when we approve our LCAP in June for 22-23. Are there any questions regarding the template and the narrative um, on how the funds we received as one times funds tied to the LCAP, how we're spending them, how we've engaged our community partners, and how we're tying our plans together. I hit spinning. I know, get, hold on, <laughs> buckle up. Buckle up, Ms. Jones, that's one of four parts. Okay. So the next section that we're required to talk about today is, is updating our budget overview for parents. Back in June, you approved the LCAP 2122 budget overview for parents. We're required to update that with any money we received in between June and now in February. So this is the, the if you wanted to see in your, if you haven't, uh, hold on here. So this is a revised budget overview for parents. You can see that in this particular overview for parents, we had a projected revenue of $81.8 million. Our total budget expenditures for the 21-22 school year um, that were not in the LCAP were 69 million. Those are coming from the general fund. And then the, uh, the portion in green and the portion in gray did not change because those refer to the learning continuity plan and we didn't have any updates there. I'll go back here real quick. So I did this to make it easy to see where the differences were because if you're trying to compare them side by side, there are so many numbers on there that your head will spin. So we, in June, on the budget overview for parents, we had a revenue, total LCFF revenue of 52089817 we received the SNC augmentation 
So our revised SNC, our revised LCFF funds are fifty-three million one hundred and seventy-seven thousand one hundred and sixty-eight. The same thing goes with the LCFF supplemental and concentration. In June, we had we were allocated ten point six million. We're now up to twelve million because of the supplemental augmentation in the SNC. Our state funds decreased. Our local funds increased a little, but you're going to see this biggest jump right here. In the federal funds from 4 million to 18 million, those are all those one time dollars that we talked about in the narrative. ESSER 3, ELO, ESSER 1, ESSER 2 are all calculated in there. So our revenue projected has increased by about 11 or 12 million because of the one time funds we received and the supplemental augmentation we received in LCAP. And I just put it in a narrative form. We received an additional 14 million in federal COVID relief funding. Um, and that's in ESSER 3 ELO. And ELO was first allocated as a state grant and then it was split into state and federal grants. Um, so it's $3.5 million, but they split it now into four different grants that we have to account for. Educator effectiveness was 827,000 and the augmentation to supplemental and concentration, an additional 1.3 million. Targeted for foster youth, English learners, and low income, and increasing um, employees who provide direct services to those students. Okay, that's a budget overview for parents. Short and sweet. Any questions about that? All right, now this is the meaty part. This is where my geek is gonna come out because I love data. So this is the mid-year outcome data. This is da data that I had available as of February 1st. The law required us to report only on data we had available to us. And we have to do it by goal. So this was our first goal in our LCAP. Student achievement through collaboration, standards aligned instruction, use of instructional strategies, and access to a broad course of study. That's our LCAP goal number one. When you look at our LCAP metrics or our goals, they're gonna be in three stages right now at this point in the year. They're gonna be that we know what they are because it's hard data, it's a snapshot in time and we have that. They could be in progress because we're working on it or they could be that we just don't know yet because that data doesn't come till later in the spring or at the end of the year. What we don't know yet is a college and career readiness indicator. That has not yet come out on the dashboard and may not come out until later in the spring. So keep that in mind that if, you, if you're going line item by line item in our LCAP, that's the piece we do not have data for at mid-year. CASP, so this is our CASP LA data. We tested 645 out of 922 11th graders. So we had about a 70% participation rate when the state requires a 95% participation rate. But I think we did an amazing job to get 70% of our students in distance learning to take the CASP LA and the CASP math. I wanted to point out here, this is English language arts. So if you're looking at your colors, the blue is all students, red English learners, the gold color is students with disabilities, students who are experiencing homelessness and students who are low income. You do not see foster youth on here because the number is so small, we don't get data on them. If you look overall as a district, 62% of our students met or exceeded the standards in English language arts. Amazing, that's wonderful. 53% of our students who are experiencing homelessness and 55% of our students who are low income that in exceeded the standards in English language arts. But when you look at this chart, you can see right away where our areas of concern are, right? Our areas of concern are with our English learners and our students with disabilities. There is a huge achievement gap between our all student group and our students with disabilities and our students who are English learners which is why when Patty presented today, you saw some of the changes coming in our English learner program, which is why a lot of the money in educator effectiveness went into students with disabilities. It went into inclusionary practices. It went into accommodations and modifications that support IEPs because we have a gap and we will probably qualify for differentiated assistance as a district because our students with disabilities and our English learners are probably going to be in the red. CUHS, it's very similar. Desert Oasis, because of the small numbers, we don't have a lot of data, but 38% of the students there met or exceeded um, the standards, 6% of the English learners. 
and 32% of the low income. And then at Southwest, you see 63.69 students. There were no homeless students last year reported or very few that we didn't get data and then the low income. But overall as the districts, the 70% of our students were tested, 62% of them overall met or exceeded standards. But our areas of concern and our areas of focus continue to be English learners and students with disabilities. You're gonna see that replicated here in math. Our numbers in math are much lower. Don't be uh, misled by the fact that the bars are still high, right? Because we're talking about 23% of our students out of 65% that were tested, 23% met or exceeded standards in math. And the disparity between the all student and the English learner and student with disabilities is much more marked here in math than it was in English language arts. And you can see that pattern across the board. Southwest had 25% of their students meet or exceed in math. But again, the disparity is there for English learners and our students with disabilities. Again, why you see so much focus in a lot of our plans on those two groups of students. So our English language proficiency, I'm not gonna dwell on this because Patty did a great job of explaining it today, but overall we had 21% of our students well-developed and 37% moderately developed. And I broke it down a little bit more. So our students who are experiencing homelessness and that are English learners, that scored level three and level four was 59%. So 59% of our students who are homeless and our English learners scored a level three or four. 56% of our students who are English learners and who are also low income. And 32% of our students with disabilities who are English learners uh, scored a three or a four. Graduation rate. Overall last year, um, this data is a four or five year graduation rate. So usually we just see four, but they modified it a little bit because of COVID. And it's a one year graduation rate for Desert Oasis, just one year. 86.7% 86 86 of our students in the cohort graduated, meaning when they started as freshmen, they graduated from high school in four or five years. They gave us that fifth year last year because of COVID. 88% at Central, 93.3% in that one-year cohort at Desert Oasis, 86.7% at Southwest, and we had a goal of 95%. We fell a little bit short, but we were in, in a distance learning situation. You can see here our graduation rate that we don't have the huge disparities that we had in our meeting or exceeding standards. There's a little bit of a disparity, but it's not as marked as it was in our academics. CTE completer rates, 57% of our students overall um, completed a CTE pathway of our 12th graders, 16% of our 11th graders, 18% of our English learners, 18% of our students with disabilities, 22% of our students who are experiencing homelessness, 100% of our foster youth because we had one and that student completed, and 32% of our low incomes completed a CTE pathway in 2021. And the red bar is our goal, so we were a little bit below our goal on, that, on our district. Again, 45% at, at um, Central, 72% at Southwest, and Desert Oasis didn't have any completers last year. Just quickly, this was another one of our metrics that we were supposed to add pathways. We added biomedical technology. We're still working on um, child development and family services, and we're still working on ag mechanics. However, we added dual enrollment welding so it's a step in the right direction. These are our A through G completion rates. I'm not gonna dwell on these because you get to hear me talk all again about A through G. So just really quickly, we have a 29% A through G completion rate in our district. But again, I just wanna note the difference between our all students and our English learners. Redesignation rates, Patty did a great job explaining these. This is a metric that we're required to put in by the state. They wanna know how many, oh no, not this one. This is AP and IB testing. Sorry, I'm on the wrong. I'm thinking of A through G and completer rates. AP and IB testing. 34% of our students district-wide passed their AP test. 69% of our IB and 37% of our students who took an IB test passed with a five or higher. The difference in AP, you can pass with a three or a four. In IB, you need a five, six, or seven. And you can also pass with the four, but they're looking more, colleges look more for that five, six, or seven. This is the one, that's a state metric. 
So the state requires us to report on how many of our students complete A through G and complete a CTE pathway. So 13% of our 12th graders completed an A through G path, an A through G and completed a CTE pathway. 5% of the 11th graders and 16% was our goal. So we were really close to meeting that goal. You can see a little bit, it's a little bit higher at Southwest than Central and Desert Oasis um, because we didn't have any CTE completers last year. We didn't have any that met this metric. I wanted to talk a little bit about A through G requirements and special ed because if you go back, I'm going to talk about this later, but if you go back here, you'll notice that 0% of our students with disabilities met A through G. So I want to just kind of go back and take a second to look at that. So we had 1,006 seniors last year. Uh, 82 of those were students with, in special education, students with IEPs. There are 91 seniors in AVID and one special education student in AVID. 253 of the 1,006 met A through G and none of our students in special ed did. However, I just want to note this part that we did have students enrolled in AP Spanish out of special ed and of those four, three passed with a five. No, three passed, two passed with a four, one passed with a five but we didn't have any other students enrolled in A through G, in AP classes. Uh, when I did some research on that today as to like why, what happened, the biggest problem that our students in special education face when completing A through G is that they're not meeting the course requirements. So our students in special ed take basic English, basic math, basic science, and A through G does not recognize those as A through G completion courses. So although they graduate, because they're taking basic courses, they're not meeting A through G requirements. And there was one who, who missed the fine arts, uh, one who missed the fine arts piece, but for the most part it was they were missing 20 credits in English, 30 credits in math, 20 credits in social studies because their courses were social studies basic, science basic, math basic, and they don't count for A through G. They meet their needs, but they don't count for A through G. Ms. Pena. respond to that I, I would say so one of the things we're doing is we're creating uh we're miss zavala and i are looking at our special education courses and we're creating course sequences and if we create course sequences with the same standards that they're that they're using in some of the other courses we might be able to get them a through g approved that's one step the other step is working with our staff on inclusionary practices accommodations and modifications so that more of our students can go into a general education course that is A through G approved and be successful. The other piece is that a lot of our students in special ed in the general education classroom receive a grade of a pass or fail. And that's an A through G must be a C or better. They don't take the pass or fail in A through G. So that's the other thing that we're looking at. Does our board policy, which allows us to let students just get a pass and not a letter grade, work to their advantage or to their disadvantage? And we need to look at that as well. Right. So we're, we're trying to dig deeper so we can see really what's the root. And, and if we get a differentiated assistance, we can do a root cause analysis on this and really because we have the A through G money and other things and get to the bottom of it. But from my limited research I could do in the last week or so, they're not meeting course requirements because their courses are tagged as basic. They're passing courses with a P, which does not meet the requirement of a C or better. And then um, also they're not able to get into the higher math classes that require the three years of math four recommended. Yeah. Goal two, I'm really quickly, we don't have any of our survey data. You've seen this data, CAS BLA, CAS math. Um, so pretty much goal two was uh, promoting the achievement of all students through professional development and really supporting our teachers. And we had some survey data tied to that, which we won't have till the um, spring. And also the other metrics were our English language proficiency assessment, our ELA, and our math, which we just talked about. And goal three is all about CUVA, right? It's our brand new school. It's our alternative to in-person instruction. I don't have this survey data in the graduation rate yet because we haven't had a class graduate from there. But I did do our enrollment. We were up, um, and this was done last week. Uh, we are enrolled at 151 at that time. Daryl's been doing a lot more enrollment, so I think we're a little bit higher. At that point in time, 31% of our students were ninth graders, 
27% were 10th graders, 25% were 11th graders, and about 18% were 12th graders. So we, had, we, we have a goal about enrollment and attendance. So this is the attendance piece. We were looking for a 95% attendance rate. And as you can see, we started a little bit rough in month one, but as we've been increasing attendance as we go on. And month five was um, December-ish, uh, and it, we were at about 98% attendance. And keep in mind that attendance at CUBA is very different. It's not students sitting in their chairs. It's do they do their work? Do they meet with their teacher? Do they complete their work? So um, we had about 97.6% attendance. Goal four was creating this community school atmosphere. And, and this is really a big thing at the state level now, that wraparound services for parents, the place for parents to come and get everything that they need. And that's what goal four was all about. Um, I don't have any survey data available at this time. That's my piece I'm missing. Here's our district-wide attendance for months one through six. You can see in our regular programs, we took a dip in month three, but we've been hovering up there around 92, 93 average. Our special day class has a little bit lower attendance. That's not uncommon. A lot of times your students that are in a special day class or, or have more than 50% of their time in special ed have a lots of medical needs. They have other reasons why they're missing school. And then our independent study, this is not CUVA, this is short-term independent study, and we're at about 92%. Our chronic absentee rate, these are students who miss more than 18 or more days. Um, you can see as a district, we were at about 5%. Desert Oasis at 75.4%. That looks shocking when you see it on paper, but I want you to keep in mind how students end at Desert Oasis, right? There are students who have chronic absentee problems. There are students who might have a little bit more trouble behaving sometimes and they might get suspended more often. So don't be shocked by that. Um, and also too, keep in mind the small number that are there. You know, so one divided by two is 50%, where if you have a bigger number, one divided by 300 is a much smaller number. Right, we're gonna try to do that percentage in my head right now. But overall, we had 5% um, at, as a district, Central at 4.4, Desert Oasis at 75.4, and um, Phoenix Rising and Southwest both had no students reported as chronically absent. And if you look across the board, with the exception of our students who are foster youth, and our students who are experiencing homelessness, it's pretty average across the board. But we do need to focus in more on our foster youth and our students who are homeless and why they're missing school more often. Obviously, it could be court appointments, it could be they're looking for housing, it could be that they're in, you know, they're in therapy because chronic absentee does not care if it's excused or unexcused. Just 18, 10%, so 18 days. You could have been sick for 18 days in the hospital and you're gonna be tagged as chronically absent. You could have been truant for 18 days and you're gonna be tagged as chronically absent. The state doesn't care, excused or unexcused, it's 18 absences or more on a 180 day school year. Dropout rate. We had a dropout rate of about 10% last year. Our ELs at about 13.7, students with disabilities at eight, low income at 10.6. Again, our students at foster youth at 23.1 and our students who are homeless at 8.7. And I'm gonna be honest and tell you that this is mostly attributed to a lot of our students left the country last year and we didn't know where they went. So the minute you put in your system that they moved and their whereabouts are unknown, until we can go back and change that, we know where they are, they're a dropout. So I don't put a lot of stock in that our students are just quitting school and not wanting to be here. It really had to do with the pandemic and a lot of our students moving or becoming homeless and we just didn't know where they were because our dropout rate is statistically is not that high. But again, I am concerned with one fourth of our foster youth. We didn't know where they went last year. So goal five was basic services. Again, I don't have a lot of the data for goal five. Um, we, we estimated that we would have about two teacher misassignments. Um, I'm, I haven't had a chance to, this is mid-year, right? So we've been working on correcting those. It's possible we won't have any. Uh, and that was the only piece I had for that. I didn't have any of the other data. Woo, breathe. <laughs> any questions about the data? You're in my world now. Data is, it is fun for me. I like data. Yeah. I mean, the, gra the graphing, the visuals are very good. Visuals are very, like, you know, comprehend yeah. comprehendable. Yeah, some of the data, I mean, it really it points out what we need to work on as a district, right? Yeah, it was very Where our areas of focus need to be. 
So this is the next piece. This is our mid-year expenditure and implementation data on all actions in the LCAP. You know what this made me think, Rana, why did you put so many actions in the LCAP? That's what I first thought. Um, but let's just take a look. So goal one, again, student achievement through collaboration, standards aligned instruction, access to broad courses study. So just as a quick overview, because I was required to go action by action, but I thought, well, how can I make this like a visual that you could kind of see quickly? We have not started the work on formative assessments and we've not started the library improvements at Central. Those are the two actions in goal one that have yet to be started at all. We've completed expanded options in math and science. We completed Phoenix Rising. We completed our EL team. We completed our master scheduling using Cardonix or Education Advanced. We've completed courses in our, in our uh, master schedule that are AVID, AP, and IB. And we completed um, having our, our resource teachers, right? Those are there. We're still working on the ones in the middle. We're still working on tutoring. We're still working on expanding our CTE, credit recovery, intervention and support for struggling students, SEL during advisory, enhanced counseling services, the CTE facilities, college, all of those are ongoing, right? We will not complete them till the end of the year. But this is what the state required me to do. So I'm gonna just do, give you a few highlights. Um, so you can see in the red, that's how much we budgeted in our LCAP. That's what you approved in June. In the green is our expenditures from first interim. And then on the right is just some of my implementation notes. Like for example, 1.1, uh, which was um, our math and science has a lot of personnel, it's very personnel heavy. We budgeted 449,000 and about midway through we were close to 200,000. So that's pretty like, okay, we're on a good track, right? But if you go to this one, which is 1.2, which is where content teams were going to meet, talk about formative assessments, talk about summative assessments. It was money for them to use after school on Saturdays. We just haven't spent very much of that money. And some of them have met, but we don't have really a consistent district-wide plan. And I think we're working on that with DNA, which is what Patty talked about earlier. And then we have tutoring being offered after school in many different formats. And this $578,000, um, we've only hired one of the three teachers in that goal. And we haven't done some of the other improvements either. Um, there's another one like this one. So if you go to 1.7, increased instructional time to provide support service. This is our coaches and Patty and Monica. So what we found when we were looking at the interim is we had budgeting issues. We, for, uh, payroll and ed services, we did not speak the same language at the beginning of the year. So we didn't get everybody appropriately lined to be taken out of the LCAP. I will tell you that kudos to Michelle and Rosanna, who spent probably, what, 16, 24 hours getting all that fixed. So now everybody is appropriately coded to the right place in LCAP, and we will begin to spend that money. It isn't that we haven't done anything, it's that we had some line items that were incorrect. And those ladies worked tirelessly in the conference room and even ate their lunch for about three days straight to get it fixed, so kudos to them. <clears throat> um, another one is, again, um, this one, 1.13, the master scheduling resources, that contract was coded to the, was coded inappropriately. So we need, we recoded it. And so we will, that money will be spent. That's the exact amount of the contract. This is another one where, uh, where we had 2.5 million budgeted, but we'd only spent 108. It's again, we had some coding issues. We had to go back and make sure all personnel was correctly coded, which was a good reason, good reason to do this. We got everything straightened out mid-year through the, midway through the year. Um, so this one, 1.15, Craig and his library, we have some great plans for it to turn into a, a library like they have at Southwest, but in the style of Central, what Central feels like, but we've had classes in there all year. So we haven't been able to do any of that repurposing work that we wanted to do because that Promise House has been in there all year long. Again, some payroll adjustments had to be made for that uh, 1.17. The same thing with 1.19, we had to make some payroll adjustments. So if you just look strictly at first interim, not counting the fact that we had payroll adjustments to make and all of those things that were coded incorrectly, we had budgeted 9.6 million and we had spent about 1.2 million. But when we come back in June, you will see that we will spend all, most, this money will mostly all be spent. Heavily, heavily tied in payroll and personnel, <coughs> which usually accounts for about 80% of a school's budget. So goal two, 
We did not get the EdTech Academy off the ground yet, and our cross-department collaborations have not occurred yet. We have in progress the access to technology, the professional development, the instructional support team. We still need to add the CTE and college and the CTE college and career instructional coach that's in our LCAP. We're still working on that job description. That's a process to go through. We, um, we have new teacher academies, induction and mentors. We're working on curriculum development and course collaboration. We did complete the differentiated instruction for English learners because we have those courses in our master's schedule. So you can see again, um, I'll give you a good example. 2.4, we budgeted 115,000 and we spent about 50. That's all personnel, so we're on track there. Access to technology, we budgeted about 340,000 and so far we've spent 111,000. Um, 2.5, again, is another one that requires some personnel, some budget adjustments. At Tech Academy, we budgeted almost $200,000, but we have yet to get that off the ground with everything required to get the STEM building open. That's been kind of pushed to the side for now. And um, the course collaboration to support English learners, those are some of the plans that Patty talked to you about earlier that are gonna take place starting in March. So again, we budgeted 1.3, 1.4 million, and we spent so far 322,000. If you don't take into account that we've needed to do budget adjustments, just flat looking at the dollars. Goal three is Cuba. So we've either completed everything at Cuba or it's in progress. Um, staffing, again, we started late. We had a lot of subs. We haven't spent all of the money, but we are still, st we are still working on that. We're looking at it, we're holding on to 3.2 for when we move into the portables because we're looking at some flexible seating furniture, we're looking at some different types of furniture that will be more conducive to students who are in independent study. Um, and we are um, getting materials and supplies. I mean, this is, again, when we move, we're gonna have some more things we need. And we have purchased Edgenuity and Acellus already, so we've pretty much spent that money. And professional development, we're still, um, working through that money. Well, the, some of the things we've done have been during the day, so we haven't spent a lot. I do believe there's a conference coming up for independent study that Gerald's gonna be using some of that money for. So we budgeted about 800,000, and so far we've spent about 187,000. Goal four, um, we have a lot more in goal four. So goal four is the one when I was really doing all of this work that I thought, wow, we, there's a lot in goal four that was personnel that we just haven't had a chance to get yet. So we need to hire our new community liaison or attendance outreach specialist. We need to hire our family resource center coordinator and we're no longer offering the pregnant and parenting teen class so that, that money will be reallocated. We are working on our parent and staff communication. We just haven't purchased the digital signage in our LCAP. So Daryl has a digital sign, the district office is getting a digital sign, although I think we are, we are giving the digital sign to Phoenix Rising instead of the district office so they can have their own, we can start branding Phoenix Rising as its own campus. We haven't done that. Um, and transportation services, we did buy two new buses. So again, you can just see the budget as you go through. Um, 4.3, the money's still sitting there because we haven't hired that position yet. We're still working on that job description. Um, and then positive, they're beginning to spend 4.4. This money is not well spent in 4.1 because those, each of those digital signs are about 40 to $50,000 plus whatever it costs to get them in the ground and the wiring and the DS, if we need DSA approval and all of those things. That money's sitting there for that. Um, we did purchase the two new buses, but they need to be coded back to LCAP. And this program is no longer operational, so that money will have to be readjusted. Um, so we, we budgeted $2 million and our estimated actuals were about 260,000. We still have um, some budget adjustments to make. Goal five, um, we've completed, we, there isn't anything we haven't started, but you can see here similar things with goal five. We're qualified teachers. We've advertised in the newspaper and billboards. That's where that money came from. Our facilities upkeep, we've spent the majority of that money Catapult, EMS, and ARS are in use. We need to do those budget adjustments there as well. We did our training in Too Good for Drugs and Too Good for Violence, <clears throat> but we're still working on the program that'll take place on Saturdays. 
And then um, we're getting ready to purchase some books for 5.5. And we did purchase some, but we need to go back and do a budget adjustment. So this is just an overall of, of all of our goals. So we had contributed, we had a budget, an LCAP budget of $15.288 million. And to date we spent three point, oh, I missed a comma, $3.3 million. And just some budget notes that budget adjustments and payroll have yet to be made. Funding allocated for staff that is yet to be hired. Extra duty meetings and collaboration have been minimal. And Saturday school sessions and intercessions have yet to be offered. In some of the goals, we're doing Saturday school, but not the way they are in the LCAP, and digital signs yet to be purchased. So just a couple of big ticket items why there's such a disparity. Any, any questions about the budget or about those pieces? For this one, I just have one last slide. Look, we made it, Emma. So the 21-22 supplement has to be submitted with the 22-23 LCAP. Um, keep in mind that this is a point in time report, right? It's a snapshot. It's just a picture of where we are right now. And it will not need to be revised. We're going to include it just the way it is in the 22-23 LCAP. This is our snapshot in time mid-year. We don't submit it until we submit July 1, and you do not have to improve the, the, the template, but I had to present before February 28th at a regularly scheduled board meeting, so that would be today. Ooh. Lots of lots of um, work. Thank you, everybody, that helped me with this. I could not have done this myself. It takes a village. Yeah, for sure. Any questions? So what I've done, just to give you one extra piece, is like I mentioned, I created a um, a crosswalk for the principals, the assistant principals, for Alicia, for Annabelle, for anybody dealing with budgets. That kind of outlines for them the order in which we need to spend our money. So we want to always be spending this year's money on this year's students, right? Carryover is a good thing, but it's not the way funding was meant to be at the federal and state level. They give you $100,000 this year, they expect you to spend $100,000 on this year's kids, and you can only carry over so much. So when we're looking at how we're spending our money, I'm going to be working with the principals and, and the uh, resource teachers on which do we spend first. We have to spend Title I, Title II, Title III, Title IV, all of those have to be spent. They're all one-year funds with very limited carryover allowed. LCAP is one-year funding. I didn't understand that. I'm sorry, I can repeat it for you. <laughs> um, LCAP is one-year funding, and unlike any other years, in the past, if let's say we had 10 million of our LCAP left, we could just roll it over into the general fund and use it, for, you know, put it on the pool if we wanted to. I'm sorry, the aquatic center if we wanted to. But we can't do that this year. If we roll over $10 million of, of SNC, we have to use it the same way we said we were going to use it this year, plus use our $10 million we get next year. And if you don't, those, those um, advocacy groups are going to be knocking at our door, whoa, 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 wait a minute, you said you were going to do this for English learners and you haven't done it yet. So we have to be really careful and cognizant that we're spending LCAP dollars first and then all of those SR2, SR3, ELO, EEF, A through G, um, ELOP, all of those have, have ex they're out years, right? They're 24, they're 25, they're 26. So I really want to focus in on spending this year's money on this year's kids and saving the money we have in our grants that are a little bit further out um, to do those things a little bit further out. So we don't get caught up with advocacy groups knocking at our door why we're not spending our money on this year's kids. So anything else about the LCAP supplement? I'm just going to, if you are praying people, will you just pray that the state doesn't decide this was such a good idea that we have to do this every year because although it was a good experience, it does take a lot. I would do it every year if you asked me to. Let me just be really clear. And I would love doing it, but there's, uh, it is a lot of work for my people. All right. Should we go to the next one? Yes. Does that conclude this presentation? <laughs> yes. So the, the AP completion grant is an additional presentation brought to us as a gift and for a one-time money. Mm -hmm. This is one that we felt that would be necessary or, or we expected because our students do apply for this. It does require a two-part process of a presentation this month and then approval and opportunity. So this is what the presentation is. Yeah. Again, let's pass this again. Yeah. Me time, again. All of the work that went on the last one simultaneously to work in preparation <laughs> happened at the same time. Same time. That's, how, that's why you only heard from Patty in the board study. So I was like, please, Patty, let them hear a different voice than mine. Okay. 
AB 167, AB 130, let me switch my brain, is the A through G Completion Improvement Block Grant Funding Plan. This has a requirement. So there are, there are three pieces to this grant. There's the A through G Access Grant, which they allocated $300 billion, million dollars, the A through G Success Grant, and then the A through G Learning Loss Mitigation Funds. We qualified for the A through G access grant because our A through G completion rate was less than 67%. I estimated because, can I tell you what they told me, you know when they told me how much money we were receiving? Today at five o'clock. So my numbers are a little bit off, so I may have to bring it back kind of as, a, as an instant item when I actually readjust some of the numbers. So I estimated here that I was gonna receive $1,060,000. I got our numbers today. We're receiving 849,382 in uh, the A through G access grant. That's resource code 7414. And $339,366 in the A through G learning loss mitigation grant and that's 7413. That totals up to about 1.16 something. A little bit off from what they told me. And we received these funds based on our numbers of unduplicated students. Everything with LCFF centers around your unduplicated count. So I just wanted to remind us who makes up our unduplicated pupil count because you hear that a lot in regards to state, state funding. LCAP, LCFF, this is, our, this is our UPC, this is our UPP, our unduplicated pupil count. So unduplicated counted pupils, these are your students who are English learners, meet income or categorical eligibility requirements for free or reduced price meals under the National School Lunch Program or low income, and our foster youth. And they, they don't duplicate, they don't count once. They don't count twice, I'm sorry. If you're an English learner who's also low income, who's also a foster youth, you only count once in our UPP. So although, and I just wanna, just wanna um, it, that came from the LCFF Frequently Asked Questions, the link is there in case anybody asks you where I got that information. Although these, pu these pupils have to be the focus of the A through G completion grant because that's who we receive the funding for, it doesn't mean that other students can't benefit from the services because these services are replicated or these services are an extension of what we already have in LCAP, ESSER 3 ELO. So a student who's in special ed but is an English learner, they're tied to this grant. A student who is homeless and low income, which they usually always are, they can be tied to this grant. This grant was specifically funded for English learners, low income students, and foster youth because they use the same funding formula as the LCFF. Quickly, these are the A through G requirements. You need two years of history, four years of English, three years of math are required, but you're not competitive unless you have four. Two years of a lab science and they're recommending three. And when they say recommended, it means you're not competitive unless you have three. Two years required of a foreign language, they recommend three, one year of a visual and performing arts, and one year of a college prep elective. And you must pass all of those courses with a C or better. Ds do not play in A through G. You might as well have gotten an F in A through G. Now, these requirements come into play when our students are applying to a UC or a CSU. A lot of our students go to IVC. A lot of our students go into the military, they go to a trade school, they go like my daughter, out of state, Colorado State. We have a lot of students at the University of New Mexico and Las Cruces. They don't play, but meeting A through G requirements gives our students the best chance of getting into any college they wanna get into. They have to play, they have to pass it with a C or better. So this is just another explanation that the history has to be a year of US history um, or a semester of US history and a semester of government and one year of social science. Four years of college prep English and what gets a lot of our kids is not more than one year of ELD counts, right? Math has to be a minimum algebra one. You have to pass algebra one. Geometry, algebra two or integrated math. Um, the minimum requirement is three of those years. One has to be algebra one. Lab sciences, you need one by one They've changed it. They used to say one, one um, life science and one physical science, but now they're really just saying lab sciences, but they haven't been clear on that. Languages other than English, visual and performing arts, have to be two semesters from the same discipline. So you can't take one semester of dance and one semester of art, it doesn't count. It has to be the same discipline. 
or it could be if it's an interdisciplinary course, and then a college prep elective. Um, so things, these are things that we considered when we met as a team. How are, how are our courses aligned through A through G? What about our students that have to take ELD? Why are our students not meeting the requirements? And do we have any attitudes, beliefs, or perception in our district that's keeping students from being successful? Again, just a little bit more data. Um, you can see we're here. I went to the wrong one. We're here at 29.3%. In Imperial County, we are one up from the bottom at 29.3%. Sadly enough, the only, that's why I went here, the district that's a little bit lower to us, they have a much lower student population. They have a high school of about 130 kids. So we have other districts like districts, Brawley at 39.8, Calexico at 41.4, Calipatria at 41.5. So we're sitting here at 29.3% A through G completion rate for the 2021, 2020, 2021 school year. English learners, our English learners are um, sitting at 13.3%. Our low income students, 25.6%. This is some longitudinal data. So if you see we're here, like the fourth one's down. We've had a decline of about 2.6% over the last four years. Our English learners have actually grown 1.3% over the last four years. Kudos to our EL program. More of our English learners are meeting A through G. And our low income students have had a decline of about 1.2% over the last four years. This is our trend data. So all students is the green. You can see we had a peak in 2019. We were down in 2020 and then we came down in 2021. Again, you can contribute it to a lot of things, right? The pandemic, distance learning. Um, our socioeconomic um, disadvantaged students are the, are the gold, the goldenrod. These are our foster youth who have been in steady decline for three years. And this red bar represents our English learners. Overall, the only student group that rose over that period of time were our English learners. However, they're still lower from 2019, but if you look at trend data from 2018 to 2021, they had an increase. This is our cohort. Uh, this is just our cohort outcome. Again, you can just see all students, English learners. These are our students who started as freshmen and finished in four years that we've had, a, except for our English learners, we had a decline over that trend. Oh, I'm gonna stop here. Any questions about the data? Similar data to what we looked at. Yes. So on the A through G on the twenty percent ethnic studies, ethnic studies department, is that going to meet any of the A through G requirements? If our course is A through G approved, it fits in the social science category, which is A, I think. When, we, when um, Craig and Daryl work on our um, ethnic studies course, which by the way could be things like world dance, I mean it doesn't have to be a social studies course, but if it's a true ethnic studies course, they will write it to be A through G approved and it will fit in whatever category we happen to, what, what we, we choose, which will probably be social science first. A lot of districts are adding world music, world dance to meet it as well, different modalities. But yes, we will make sure it meets an A through G requirement. So we did a survey, we, we looked at our in, um, community partners, our educational partners, and we, we did a survey. So we had um, a lot of our parents, I was really pleased to see that our respondents were mostly parents. 60% of our respondents were parents. 20% were students, 2.5% uh, were counselors, and 15% were teachers. Some of them were district office staff and things like that, which they didn't, they didn't come out higher than 2.5%. Most of our responses came from Central Union High School, over 50%, Southwest at 37 and a half, and then at Promise House and Central, those that were at Central and Southwest had a small slice. Um, most of our students were sophomores and juniors that were responding. We had some freshmen and seniors and then some community members or, or staff who didn't have students. We asked them, how familiar are you with the A through G course completion requirements? Um, from one, I've never heard of them, to five being I can explain them to somebody else. And a lot of our, 
about 62% of our respondents said they were very familiar with them, which is good, right? We want that to happen. We asked them if our graduation requirements and our A through G requirements were the same or different. And so 44% said they were different. 19% said they were the same. And about 38% weren't sure. By the way, they're different. They are different, a little bit different. Here's how they're different. History and A through G, there's two years. We require three. English, we're the same, four years and four years. Math, um, it's three, and starting with next year's seniors, um, it is three. Lab science is two, we require two. Here's where we're really different. This is the biggest difference between A through G and our graduation requirements. I'm sorry, I'm terrible to videotape because I cannot stand still. Um, we re um, A through G requires two years of a foreign language and one year of a visual and performing arts. Our graduation requirement is one year and it could be a combination of anything. It could be one semester of dance and one semester of Spanish. It could be a semester of music and a semester of art. And this is where we have our biggest difference between A through G and our graduation requirements. One year of a college prep elective, we require 60 credits of elective. 10 of them are academics, which are the college prep. They are um, 150 credits required, 180 recommended, and out of our 220, of those listed, there are 190 credits. So they are different. And this is some other notes about our graduation requirements. We require PE, the state of California requires PE, A through G doesn't. We require a college and career readiness course if you're in ninth grade, but if you enter our district in 10th grade or above, it can be CTE, that's not A through G. We require a semester of health that's not A through G. So we have 30 additional credits that, a, that are not A through G and that totals our 220 credits. What do you expect to do after high school? You can see a lot of our students are going to a four-year university in California. We have a big chunk that are unsure and some that are going to junior college. We asked them if you've participated in any of our services. So they, these were the services. So you can see that a lot of our students um, had counseling regarding status of A through G, counseling regarding status of graduation, tutoring, future career planning, how to apply to college. Um, we asked them, uh, what would you be interested in? You can see re retaking classes at Ernesty are better, meeting A through G, CTE for computers, college prep workshops, meeting for school graduation, credit score, credit card education, which I thought that was pretty cool. How do you feel? Do you feel ready to go to college and career? Uh, with the one being not at all and five, I can start tomorrow. I'm so prepared. So we have a good number of students on this side of three that feel ready. And keep in mind, it was mostly sophomores and juniors that responded. And this is a question that was really important to our team is why are our students not completing A through G? What in the world do you think is going on? Why are we at 29.3% A through G completion rate? A lot of it came up that our students weren't motivated that um, the students plan for post high school, that we don't do a lot, of, a lot of work around that. That our graduation requirements don't equal A through G. They said our graduation requirements were too low. However, when you see, we're actually, the only place that we were lower was in that visual and performing arts foreign language category. COVID, our students are just trying to recover. We don't emphasize A through G enough. Um, students are not reaching for high goals. We have a lack of tutoring for ACT, SAT. Lack of parental guidance. We're not guiding the parents. The parents don't understand A through G, which is contrary to when you looked at, you know, they understood it. Failing courses and not repeating them. Lack of support from the school. English is not their first language. Math is the main issue. There's not enough support. Too much free time in classes. Students allowed on social media during class and online tutoring is needed. Check the last one because we have paper now, right? So that's one that we could complete. This is kind of a summary of the, of the themes and recurring themes that happen throughout our data. And how can we improve access or completion of, provide incentives, offer more A through G options, offer more RRR opportunities, summer, winter, online. The RRR opportunities came up often because this is what happens. Um, this is targeted at our students that get that D. So think through this with me. Eddie takes a class, Algebra 2. Eddie gets a D. Eddie 
already has to make the decision right now. If I want to go to a four-year university, I have to retake this entire class the entire year. RRR says I can work on the summer, I can work over break, I can work after school, make up those tests I failed, make up those missing assignments and get my 62% my D to a 72% C, now I'm leaving A through G. What the counselors told me that a lot of our students will say at that point in time, forget it Mr. Rodriguez, I'm just gonna go to IBC. I don't wanna take a space in my schedule next year to repeat this class when I already passed it. Obviously they're not thinking as well that they need that C to graduate in our district because we have a 2.0 graduation requirement. But that could be easily done by taking another class and you get a B in it and now you're gonna average to your 2.0, right? You could have three Ds and three Bs and you have a 2.0, which is different than the course has to be a C or better. So that was really big with a lot of our responses, especially from our parents and our students. Encourage our students to read self-selected books, have complete programs for college preparation. Uh, this came up a couple of times too, which was interesting. Create one track for students that are completing A through G and another graduation track for career students. So we talked to our, we talked to our state, they, write, they said, talk to your students when they're freshmen, what do you wanna do? I think it's a good idea in theory, but I mean, my daughter is a freshman, she changed her mind three times before she got to be a senior. And if she's on the career track and now she wants to go to, you know, we have to find a way to blend it, but it's not a bad idea to start thinking that way. Outreach to parents, tutoring again, offer more foreign languages besides Spanish and French, um, which would be good if we could find the teachers. This one was interesting. This one came up multiple times in my data, that students feel stressed about homework, that if they, they're, they're going to sports, they're out at a game till two o'clock in the morning, or they're, you know, they have a big test in IB chemistry and they can't study for their English class, that their grades are going down because the teachers weren't flexible with their homework. It came up a couple of times. And make health a year-long course. Not sure that's not even an A through G requirement, but they, that was something that they said. Any questions about this survey data? Uh, real quick, it was just like, I noticed when you talked about the tracking, like uh -huh. how it came up, but then I remembered like when in the last presentation, how it was like, we shouldn't track students, I yeah. guess. Like, so I was like, it, you know, because then the kids are gonna be with, you know, with that same group. No, no, yeah, oh no, but it was talking about the, concept, the students. There are truly, and Dr. Anderson does it a lot better than I do. There's a concept out there that as a high school, you have different pathways. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a lot of different entry and exit points along yeah. the way, so you build in those entry and exit points. So if I'm a freshman, and I know right away, I'm going into the military, I'm not going, I'm not going to a four-year university, I can be on the path that builds me up to going into the military, right? Yeah. But at any point in time, you can say, oh, change my mind, and I can easily move over. What you want to be careful is that you don't have this track that, that the walls are so high, you're stuck on it, right? You can't move over. But I don't know, Dr. Anderson, you, you have that idea more than I do. Sure. So having lived it once before in a, in a pri prior setting, there was a, a push for us to move our graduation requirements so that the base graduation requirement was A to G CSU readiness, okay? So the, the math became three years, the science lab became three years. We still have the high you know, English and social studies graduation requirements. And what we did is, is we, were, we were in a process of moving all of our students to those. We wrote graduation requirements aligned to CSU, UC entrance. And this is modeled after San Francisco, Unified, and San Jose, and a handful of other districts that have already done this. But we made a parallel track, which was a career um, pathway completion track. You still had to complete the same number of science classes and math classes as the A to G, uh, but there was a little flexibility. So rather than taking chemistry, you could take chemistry for culinary, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we found some other, other classes and we had the flexibility to create some new classes that was the third <laughs> year of math, the third year of science, that wasn't the traditional A to G track math class. So the students completed the same number of courses in those same categories, but they, had, they weren't necessarily all UC approved courses. Mm -hmm. But the requirement for the pathway completers was they had to complete a career pathway with a C or better, okay? Now, one of our metrics, which I, I don't know how, I don't know why it didn't pop up there somewhere, but in all of the data we've seen, is our college and career readiness indicator. It's not available yet, that's why they haven't that's put why. it out yet. That's right, because it hasn't been out. So the college and career readiness indicator, students that complete an A to G pathway, or, and, or, or a career pathway. Or they go 
there's actually a variety of ways, correct, that you can be considered college and career ready. So what we did is we found a way to, to create parallel tracks that had the same basic look and structure. And what we did is if you chose to say, I'm gonna go into a career pathway, you also signed a waiver, a document saying, I recognize I am not UC or CSU ready in my path. And you were also given, <coughs> excuse me, given transfer information at that time so that you knew that you could go to the community college and then transfer as a transfer student out of the community college. So we didn't ever want to just drop them off and put up, here's your road dead end. It was, no, you can choose a different path. You can still get to the same place. It just goes by way of the community college as opposed to a direct entrance. And, and we did similar things with all of our AB, as was described before, the different um, assembly bill um, routes that people can take. Because they also knew, I am not going UCA, CSU ready with an A to G completion. I have an alternative route to get there through transfer. So there is ways to structure it um, to prepare students, give them options. So one thing that, um, and I was re I, I, I really, I like this, I, I love this. <laughs> um, but one thing I, I was thinking, I was driving today and I was thinking about the whole issue about parent involvement. And one thing that I have noticed in the years um, of my son going to high school and working on scholarship programs is that parents also need to be really involved in this mm -hmm. process because I, for me, it's a, it's a personal tragedy when the students do everything they can to meet A through G, to get the grades, and then senior, spring uh, semester of senior year, parents realize they don't have, they didn't realize how much it was gonna cost, they weren't ready for it, and the student can't go. So I really believe that we have to integrate that parent yeah. involvement and knowledge of what to expect senior year very early on, you know, mm -hmm. freshman year and get them involved then exactly. because by the time they're seniors and they're already admitted, it is too late. Too late. And mm -hmm. so I've, think, I've, I've seen that happen over and over again yeah. and I think we really need to be cognizant of that and aware of that. Yeah. And I'm thinking too, I was thinking too along those same lines that taking the model that we've done with Parent University, where it's a, it's a virtual class where they can log on, that it's possibly something that when you see some of our um, guidance specialists that are A through G guidance specialists, we could put stuff together and we could bring parents virtually. Because I know Patty, I don't know if it was Patty or it was uh, Leo, but they said when they do their, still with parents, when they do their meetings virtually, they're getting a higher attendance than when they try to do them in person still. Parents work, they can log on from home at 530, still have dinner on the table. So it's definitely something we can look into. Just some other data. So in 2020, 2021, 1,213 students had the opportunity to retake courses in summer school. 681 were enrolled in online credit recovery and 100 did RRR at DO in summer 2021. This year we have 581 students currently enrolled in credit recovery and 112 students enrolled in e-intervention. 67 take credit recovery after school and 17 are enrolled in credit recovery at App Promise House. 969 of our ninth and 10th graders had at least one F on their transcript and it was out of 192 different courses. So I couldn't pin it down with an English, with a science, but we had a, almost a thousand of our ninth and 10th graders had at least one F on their transcript. Um, marking period four, which was a semester, it showed we had, we, um, had 841 Ds 609 D minuses, 461 D pluses, 1,523 Fs, and four F minuses. So I'm not quite sure how you earn an F minus. Yes. <laughs> uh, but we had a total of 3,438 Ds or Fs in first semester. You can see where they kind of fell out. There were 401 Ds or Fs in English, 660 in math from these particular courses, 332 in social studies, 323 in a lab science, 109 in a foreign language, so just in the first A to E of A through G, 1,825 failed courses that will need to be retaken if our students want to have a chance to get into CCSU. Our English language learners, and Patty gave us some more information about this that I think Patty's working on this one already. We shared this. Um, it, with our English language learners um, at semester, there were 67 Ds or Fs in these English support classes. 40, so 42% of our students enrolled in those classes had a D or an F. Um, in math, there were 28 Ds or Fs, so 47% of those students enrolled in those classes had a D or an F. And I know, Patty, 
that this F is supposed to, um, the D or it's supposed to, it's a different grading system, but that's how it showed on the transcript at first semester when I ran it. 20 Ds are Fs in social studies and 6 Ds are Fs in a lab science. So with our English learners, there are 121 failed courses that need to be retaken. And these courses are ELD support courses. Um, so again, our students are just struggling. Um, okay. I'm going to skip the use of the funds just really quickly. It can be anything that directly supports people's access or completion of A through G. This, uh, the learning loss mitigation, that 350000 roughly, has to be used for students to retake courses they failed with the D or an F. Has to be used for that. We can provide teachers with professional development. We can do comprehensive advising plans. We can have expand access to coursework, all of those activities. By April 1st, I have to upload our plan to um, CDE, and it must have been presented at a regularly scheduled board meeting prior to a regularly scheduled board meeting where it was approved, which is why it's coming so early. So this is our plan. We have three goals in our plan. Um, the first one is to provide comprehensive advising plans and support to improve CUHSD's A through G completion rate, and this is our rationale. Our educational partner feedback indicated that students and parents indicated that they feel they are not informed, educated about A through G, and lack motivation to complete A through G. Our counseling department needs assistance in dedicating time and personnel to counsel, advise, train, and conduct outreach to ensure access to and completion of A through G requirements. Also, 29% of students who are English learners and enrolled in courses designed to support them failed a course in A through D and will need to retake it. The highest rate of failure for ELs was in English at 42% and math at 47%. This is our rationale why we need this, net, why this is our goal. And this came out of a team of counselors, administrators um, that worked with me from all sites. So we, our plan is to hire three guidance support specialists to focus on students who are not meeting A through G. Again, with that focus on English learners, foster youth, and low-income students. We chose to focus on students in grades 9 through 11. Back to Maria's point, right? Get them early. We're not going to focus on our 12th graders because by the time they're in 12th grade, it's too late to make up four years of English that you might be behind. They're going to conduct ongoing outreach. We talked about making videos to post on our, on our website. We talked about um, uh, marketing campaigns. We talked about constant, you know, all kinds of things we could do. We're going to create a multi-tiered system of support to make sure that none of our students are falling through the cracks, especially those that are vulnerable to not completing A through G completion requirement or graduation requirements. Goal two is expand course offerings and opportunities for students to retake A through G courses multiple times during the year. Here's our rationale. Our educational partner feedback indicated that student schedules are impacted and oftentimes there is no room to retake a course to earn a grade of C or better. The data shows that students and parents would like more offerings during summer school, before and after school, and on Saturdays. They would like the opportunity to retake a course for a C or better during summer school, since currently most of the spaces in summer school are for credit recovery. Currently, we don't allow student or we don't have space for students to retake a course because they got a D. We're really focusing our students that failed in summer school. Um, in 2021, 1300, we, that goes to this. So first in our first semester data, the master schedule does not allow for enough sections during the school day to accommodate all students needing to retake a course. So these are our plans. Expand summer school to students who are freshmen and sophomores, so current ninth and 10th graders, and to those students who need to retake a course for a grader C or better. Identify those students and assign a counselor to support and work with them to ensure they are on track. So this uh, grant will fund four FTE teachers and one FTE counselor, specifically for students who are retaking courses for A through G, who are English learners, foster youth, low income. We're going to offer more zero or ninth periods, which we already have that in SR3, and offer reteach, retest, and replace after school and on Saturdays. That's part of our plan. That's, that's what our data says our students need. And then goal three is encourage students to complete A through G. They talked a lot about motivation, so we're looking at motivational speakers, bringing back graduate students to come and talk to the kids, different things other than just taking them on field trips to four-year universities, right? Because we were talking, I don't know if it was Patty, somebody, Leo, we, I've talked to both of them a lot this week. 
They said they took their student out of town and the student had no idea what SeaWorld was. What is that? And they live, you know, we're two hours away. So just going to university can be overwhelming. We want to also, we want them to see a student that looks just like them, that came from their part of town, that had their type of a lifestyle, that went away, was successful, and come back, or even just in their first or second year. So a lot of outreach. This um, piece has no funding attached to it because all of the funding is in ELO, ESSER 3, and LCAP. And this, the motivational activities. This is our budget. So remember, this was on my estimated budget of, of 1060000 So the guidance support specialist, um, that's about 612000 over the course of the grant. Remember that the grant funds go through 2026. 140000 for outreach supplies and posters over the course of the grant. 64000 because we're going to do professional development and multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, summer school um, personnel, 186000 over the course of the grant, about 60000 for RRR. That, at that point in time, was our total of $1,060,000. Now we might be able to put some of that extra money in the outreach to do those video presentations and things we were wanting to do. Okay, any questions? Yes. Um, on the narrative portion of the budget, you put how the funds are going to be used to increase or improve services for foster youth, low-income students, and English learners from uh, A through G eligibility. And um, I was going to ask, are we go going to include um, students with special needs in there as well? We can. I just want to make target, sure. That's our target population. But when Monica and I talked, when Monica and I were talking about some of the services, especially for summer, um, I said, look. If you've got students that are not in those target groups but need A through G support, we can definitely put them in. We just have to show in our data and in our um, our reports to the state that that's our main target, those populations. Yeah, we can definitely support other students. It's just that the language of the grant has to refer to those three groups of students because that's how we were funded. But I could I could probably go back and include if you know if space is available, we can include these others. That might be a way I can put it in there. Although we will focus on these groups of students, we will also support other students who need, who need help. Right, because I'm thinking about um, the other presentation that you had where um, students with special ed were not meeting yeah. the G requirements, yeah. so they fall can, right into what this whole project is about. Yeah, and I definitely think that we could fit that in because um, a lot of our students in special ed are also English learners, they're also low income. We can just, yeah, I can definitely reword that to say that we will also include other groups that are vulnerable to not meeting. Yeah, I can go back and reword that. When it comes back next month, I'll, I'll have a few language changes that I want to do, a few mistakes that I saw. And I also am going to have to update the budget to include the, the actual amount that we had. So in my, um, um, in my template, I'll put in the description section what changes were made and where you can find it. Yeah. Anything else? Um, so I would also recommend, and, and I don't know how how this would work but really encourage or partner with other local college bound programs such as um, the UCSD academic connections program yes. um, I know they have like a scholarship program so the students can go and take courses at uh -huh. UCSD and they get actual college credit for it so I'm thinking kind of really kind of going outside of just our district and, and really partnering with other groups that are also encouraging and supporting students who are college bound. That'll fit here. I think that'll fit here in 3.1 as well that I can include that here or I can also include that with the, um, with the outreach with 1.1. Um, that I can include that in the narrative piece as well. Okay, that's a good idea. I also just let you know I did receive feedback from one of the advocacy groups um, and their feedback had to do with the, using the word outreach and they had some suggestions on how to make it more um, meatier and more um, telling of what we wanted to do and I'll include some of those in the next one as well. I only heard back from one of them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fox. At this point, we move on to approve the publication of the school accountability report cards. So moved. Moved by Ms. Jones. I second. Second by Ms. Peinado. All in favor? Aye. 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 And approval of the personnel report. And this is the one that had that correction. Do you guys need me to read that correction no, again? I, I, no? I, I, 
You got it? Okay. Motion by Mr. Hernandez. Second. I second. Right now. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next, request the Board of Trustees approve the purchase of a refrigerated food delivery truck for the Child Nutrition Program. That's needed. Hmm. I'll make a motion. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Jones? I'll second. Mr. Rodriguez? All in favor? Aye. 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 All against? Did I just say flavor? I don't I don't know. I heard the word flavor. flavor. I'm thinking food flavor. <laughs> <laughs> but we will go ahead and once the truck is delivered, we'll have it wrapped mm -hmm. with some flavor. With some flavor flavor. <laughs> okay, request the Board of Trustees accept the 2020 2021 audit report as of June 30th, 2021. Correct. Uh, the, the technical term on this one is accept. Because okay. we don't get to approve or disapprove it, so okay. we're just going to accept their their accept. report. Okay. Do we have a second? I will second. Mr. Hernandez. All in fav favor. Favor. <laughs> Aye. 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 Any against? Certification of corrective actions for the 2021 audit findings. So these are the exceptions that were found and these are the accepting of the corrective actions that correct yes. correct madam president the the item that's there on the attachment is the um one item that needed to be corrected um and it is the, it's working with a consultant and the personnel to reconcile capital assets schedule so there was one schedule that was missing and that was the mm -hmm. finding in the audit so this is um this this item will um approve that uh, corrective action so that we'll have we'll resolve the the finding okay do i hear a motion miss jones second it i'll second hernandez mr rodriguez yeah, sir all in favor aye. 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 aye aye any against the request the board of trustees approve resolution number 0208221-11 authorizing and designating the superintendent and assistant superintendents to sign school orders so this item is a resolution which will be a roll call vote but it is an annual update of those of us in position to sign on checks as necessary it's something that we would do annually and since we've had a change in staff since miss hart has left and miss fox has joined us in the year it's time to update this okay a motion i'll make a motion i'll second Ms. Jones, second by Ms. Peinado. All in favor? Aye. 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 All against? None. Roll call vote. Oh, sorry. Trustee Rodriguez? Aye. Trustee Peinado? Aye. Trustee Jones? Aye. Trustee Garcia Ruiz? Yes. Trustee Hernandez? Aye. Thank you. The request move on to the request board approve the Central Union High School Science Ring Repurpose and Modernization Improvement bid from A and N Quality Builders Inc. So, Madam President and board members, uh, as the STEM building is very close to completion, the science teachers will soon be leaving that uh, building, and the old science wing is in desperate need of some repair. Also, the old science lab stations and plumbing and casework is very very old. Um, it's older than. Well, I don't know. It's very old. <laughs> <laughs> Older than dirt. It, it's it, it's it's in bad. It's in. It's not worth saving. And, and so we're going to repurpose the space. The law academy at Central will be moving into that space. And so things like the eye wash stations and whatnot in the casework doesn't need to be there. So this will actually remove all of that. We're not getting into the fire alarm system or the lighting or anything else. All of that is in good working order. It's just the cosmetic appearances. So this project will remove all of that, repaint the interiors, replace the flooring where needed. It also for the adjacent life science building, when we do the, it's not the interior of that one. It's the exterior of both, new paint and seal the brick. So it'll have a fresh appearance and look um, nice and attractive um, as we can make it without starting over. And this will, um, this will carry us forward for many, many, many more years for the use of that building. 
Um, and it, we're funding this one through ESSER $3, um, so it won't impact other construction funds. Okay. Oh, I'm, and this also includes resurfacing the tennis court where the construction trailer is currently sitting. We'll get to the other ones shortly thereafter. Okay. I'll make a motion to <laughs> approve the C and C and M. No, A and M. A and M. I was, was not very far. <laughs> construction to remodernize. All second, Ms. Garcia. So we have motion by Ms. Jones, second by Mr. Hernandez. All in favor? Aye. 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 All against? None. Informational items, and then we have uh, comments by ECSTA. Um, good evening, promised. board members, um, <laughs> and everyone in attendance. Um, first off, just let me say thank you, Ms. Jones, for always keeping us abreast of our extended family or our family that has um, retired. And I was uh, quite upset this morning when I heard about Janet because she was yeah. in my building, and I, I really like Janet. She was really nice. Me too. Um, yeah. Uh, so thank you. Um, also, um, board members, brace yourselves because we're about to begin the negotiation cycle. Um, so just letting you know about that. Uh, we should begin this week, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think Thursday. yeah. So. Um, Looking forward to that. That's all I'll say about that. Um, we had some issues that I sent you an email about, but they're mm -hmm. getting resolved. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Mr. Perkel to uh, for the fruitful conversation we had, and Dr. Andrews, I'll communicate with you the results of that, and hopefully we can come up to some resolution. Um, aside from that, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone here from CSEA? I don't see anybody. No? I didn't see a bit. No? Okay. So long, farewell, I'll be you saying goodbye. Okay, uh, so that, do we need closed session again? No? No. Not unless you want to meet again. <laughs> no. Okay, so meeting is adjourned at 821. Mm -hmm.